What a fascinating and stimulating conversation. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary and Dr. Kaufman with us. Uh, some of you have already submitted questions. So just a reminder that you can submit questions in two ways, events at brookings.edu and hashtag 19A on Twitter. So our phenomenal lineup of speakers continues. We are now going to turn our attention to the history of women's suffrage in the United States, States with one of the most authoritative experts on the topic, author Susan Ware. Susan is a pioneer in the field of women's history and a leading feminist biographer. She is also the author and editor of numerous books on 20th century US history. Educated at Wellesley College and Harvard mm -hmm. University, she has taught at New York University and Harvard, where she served as editor of the biographical dictionary, Notable American Women, Completing the 20th Century, which was published in 2004. Since 2012, she has served as the general editor of the American National Biography, published by Oxford University Press, under the auspices of the American Council of Learned Societies. Ware has long been associated with the Schlesinger Library at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, study where she serves as the honorary women's suffrage centennial historian. The Library of America will publish a women's suffrage anthology edited by Ware in 2020. Dr. Ware, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I have been tasked with providing a quick history lesson uh, a snapshot of the rich scholarship documenting the decades long fight to win the right to vote. So let me start with the suffragists themselves. Suffragists had a strong sense of history. Uh, in many ways, they were our first women's historians collecting volumes of material while the struggle was still going on. And we should be grateful for their efforts, but we also need to recognize its limits. Marking the centennial of the 19th Amendment demands a history that not only documents the past, but also speaks to our own times. And fully telling the history of women's suffrage means putting race at the center of the story, not the periphery. And this cuts several ways. The first is the necessity to acknowledge the racism that plagued many of the leaders and no doubt many of the followers uh, from the very start and not just Southerners. Leaders pandered to racist arguments and fears to advance their cause and were unwilling to welcome African-American suffragists into mainstream suffrage organizations. That record has to be recognized as part of the movement's legacy. Attention to race also leads in a different direction to a much fuller appreciation of the contributions African-American women made to the women's suffrage movement. Through their women's clubs, churches, and civic groups, African-American women brought something that was often lacking among white suffragists, an intersectional vision that refused to separate gender from other factors such as race and class, and which made voting rights part of a larger conversation about social and political change. This story too must be recognized as a key part of suffrage history. And finally, attention to race reminds us that the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920 was an incomplete victory, especially for women of color. In 1920, the vast majority of African Americans still lived in the South, where their voting rights were effectively eliminated by devices such as whites-only primaries, poll taxes, and literacy tests. For Black women, it was the Voting Rights Act of 1965, not the 14th, 15th, or 19th Amendments that finally removed the structural barriers to voting. In parallel disfranchisements, Native American women did not win the right to vote until 1924. All Puerto Rican women could not vote until 1935, and Chinese women not until 1943. Whenever we say women won the vote in 1920, there should always be a mental asterisk 
attached to that statement. So why does the history of the 19th Amendment matter? The women's suffrage movement stands out as one of the most significant and wide ranging moments of political mobilization in all of American history. As late as the first decades of the 20th century, a fundamental responsibility of citizenship was still arbitrarily denied to half the population. The 19th Amendment changed that increasingly untenable situation representing a breakthrough for most, but not all, American women, as well as a major step forward for American democracy. Three generations of women honed their political skills in the women's suffrage movement, and those skills were put to good use after the vote was won. In their new roles as women citizens, women made a difference, which is another way of saying that women's history matters. Historian Anne Ferrer Scott provided an especially clear image of how winning the vote was part of larger changes in women's lives and in American society more broadly when she wrote, this is a quote, suffrage was a tributary flowing into the rich and turbulent river of American social development, end of quote. Think of the contributions of those three generations of women I mentioned as the tributaries that make up suffrage history. Each distinctive element flowed into the larger stream, creating something stronger and more powerful than the individual voices. And then think of suffrage history as a powerful strand in the larger stream of US history especially its ongoing but still imperfect commitment to equality and diversity. That is why suffrage mattered and still does 100 years later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ware. Uh, Dr. Ware has certainly given us a deeply interesting, I would say historical appetizer. Uh, <laughs> And for those of you who are interested in understanding the story in much greater depth, I urge you to consult Dr. Ware's website, susanware.net for her tremendous scholarship in this area. But what a fantastic lead in for today's uh, panel discussion. I am joined by my colleagues here at the Brookings Institution and I'm going to introduce them. Uh, Dr. Isabel Sawhill, Senior Fellow for Economic Studies, whose research spans a wide array of economic and social issues including fiscal policy, economic growth, poverty, social mobility, and inequality. Her latest book is The Forgotten Americans and an Economic Agenda for a Divided Nation, published by Yale University Press in 2018. We're also jo joined by Dr. Elaine Kmark, who is a senior fellow in the Governance Studies Program, as well as the director of the Center for Effective Public Management at Brookings. She is an expert on American Electoral Politics and Government Innovation and Reform in the United States, OECD Nations and Developing Countries. She focuses her research on the presidential nomination system and American politics and has worked in many American presidential campaigns. Her most recent book released last month is Picking the Vice President, How Picking the Vice President Has Changed and Why It Matters. Dr. Makeda Henry Nicky is a fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. Dr. Henry Nicky is a re also a resident fellow of the Race, Prosperity and Inclusion Initiative, where her work is focused on the future of work, education and financial well-being of marginalized communities. She is most recently the author of Skills and Opportunity Pathways, Building an Inclusive Workforce for the Future. So welcome colleagues. Um, we've had three very compelling prologues to our discussion. And I wanted to frame our conversation here by starting with a recently released Pew survey, uh, which found that 49% of men surveyed thought the US had not done enough when giving equal rights to women. But, and I'm sure you're not shocked, uh, an overwhelming majority, 64% of women, expressed the opinion that the country had not done enough uh, when giving equal rights to women. The same survey found that among women, 46% of white women say that the 19th Amendment 
was the most important milestone in advancing the position of women in the US. While only 36% of black women and 38% of Hispanic women identified the 19th Amendment as the most important milestone in advancing the position of women. So majority of women say we have more to do uh, to provide equality to women. And uh, there's a difference by race when considering the importance of the 19th Amendment, one of the most significant social movements in the US. So Belle, I'm gonna start with you. Um, in your view, have women made significant progress in the US? Sorry about that. I said oh, that no I was very happy to, to be here and uh, in this distinguished company. And uh, in terms of your question, Camille, I think there's been a lot of progress. Uh, women have opportunities to work uh, and paid jobs that they didn't used to have. They have a lot more opportunity to get educated. They have an ability to control their own fertility that didn't exist back in the early part of the 20th century. They're able to control their own money. Uh, it goes uh, on and on. And we have a number of wonderful essays on our uh, 19A website that spell out in detail many of the uh, many of what's happened of the trends in these in these areas. For example, Janet Yellen has an essay on what's happened to uh, women's uh, education and labor force participation. Uh, our colleague Andre Perry has a very interesting paper on how black women have become more active and been elected to political office. And I was very pleased to see that essay come out about the same time that uh, Kamala Harris was uh, nominated to be uh, vice president. We have another paper by Paula England on how progress largely stalled out in about 2000. Uh, the biggest gains both in employment, uh, in entering a broader range of occupations and in shrinking the pay gap occurred in the 1970s and 1980s and um, slowed down in the 1990s and have been virtually stagnant in the 2000s. I have to say a word about my mother because um, it may be hard for younger people to understand why I am seeing so much progress. My mother was 17 when the uh, 19th Amendment was enacted. She never graduated from high school. She never worked outside the home. She had an illegal and dangerous abortion uh, because there was no uh, effective birth control in those days that was legal. Uh, she didn't get to make very many decisions uh, in our family, maybe the color of the draperies or what we were going to have for dinner but not where we went for vacation and even, not even what kind of car we bought. My father made all those decisions. If she were still alive, she'd be 117 years old. And when I compare my own life to hers, I would have to feel very lucky. That doesn't mean more progress isn't needed, uh, but I do want to take this moment to celebrate what we've already achieved. I think in part because what, of what I saw in my mother's life, I decided to get a PhD and escape the typing pool. Uh, I was a typist in my early career years. I then wrote my doctoral dissertation on the pay gap between men and women. And by the way, some of you may not know this, but when I was a young adult, if you wanted a job and you went to the classified ads in your local newspaper, they were all segregated in between help wanted female and help wanted male. There was just an assumption that women did certain kinds of jobs and men did others, and there was no mixing of the two. Uh, I love Secretary Albright's comments about being the only woman in the, uh, in the room and being afraid to speak up. Uh, she and I both represent that older generation, and I will add one more anecdote to the stories here, which is that I used to be on a board uh, that met in a private club in New York City, and when I arrived for meetings, I had to wait in the ladies' room, the reason being that ladies, quote unquote, as we were called then, were not allowed in the main rooms uh, of the club. 
So I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Belle. Um, very, very interesting and great reflections. Uh, Elaine, have we made a lot of progress? Okay, um, I do think we've made a lot of progress, but frankly, in the area of politics, we've probably made less progress than we have in the area of economics, although Bell and I could, could go back and forth on that. Um, uh, clearly, there are a lot of women running for office, a lot more than there used to be, and a lot of women getting elected. And let me give you, from my own life as a scholar, um, a, a short preview of, of what's happened. The very first book I read on women in politics was by former Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick. She wrote a 1974 book called Women in Politics. And the thesis of that book was, well, women got into politics after they had raised their children. And because of that, they tended to do fairly well. They got to, they got to be city council members or members of the state legislature, but by and large, they just ran out of time. By the time their children were grown and they were in their 40s or 50s, um, some women did get their first legislative position, their first electoral position, but there was no way they were going to get to be president because they simply didn't have enough years left to do that. And I thought that was a bit, that was very, it's a very interesting time capsule about, you know, uh, where women were at that point in time. In the intervening years, there were various other explanations for why women were not running for office. Um, some of them was that they didn't come from the networks that could raise money. They didn't have the, the financial connections the way men did. Um, some of them were that women needed to be mentored or felt that they needed to be mentored. It's that feeling that I think you referred to, Belle and Madeline referred to about being, uh, wondering if you should speak in the meeting. Um, women but wanted to be, what? Uh, women wanted to be asked to, um, you know, want to be asked to run for office and that didn't always happen. Um, and, and so that was some of the scholarship in those intervening years. Just two years ago, a graduate student of mine at Harvard uh, wrote her master's thesis on women in politics and she interviewed about 30 um, female state legislatures. And legislators are, the, are an important group because that's always the farm team in politics in male or female, you know, that's where so many people get their start. And what she found was, oh, they raised money fine. They weren't at worrying about being asked. They were self-confident, but we were back to motherhood. We were back to the fact that state legislative jobs are part-time jobs in many states. The state capitals are far away from where people lived, where their district was. Um, they couldn't get home at night to put the kids to bed at least, let alone make them dinner. Um, and that there were financial, there were real financial burdens there because the women couldn't afford, often these women were contributing to the household and they just couldn't afford to give up their full-time jobs and go be state legislators. So there were, it, it was sort of interesting to me to read these comments because we'd come all the way back to motherhood and the basic problem of trying to do what is a very demanding job uh, under situations where, you know, when you meet all night in the state legislature to get through that three month session, right? There's no daycare around. <laughs> um, you can't bring the baby to the floor to nurse the baby if you've got a young baby. I mean, it's just all sorts of logistical hurdles. And of course, one of the solutions there is to make some of these jobs more full-time jobs, a more regular uh, kind of job, which a lot of states just don't do. So it, it's been an interesting transition in women running for politics. The thing that, that made me happiest in 2018 was to see the huge number of women who ran, the biggest number ever, by the way, most of them Democrats, and to see the spunk they had, they were not waiting to be asked. OK, they they didn't they had sort of almost that same confidence, although I'm not quite sure anybody has the confidence of these 27 year old men, many of whom have been in my classes and your classes who think they could be president tomorrow. Um, but, you know, but but they're getting there. The, these women had absolute confidence. They were absolutely sure of themselves. And um, I was very pleased to see that in 2018. And I'll I'll talk more about 2018 in a minute. Great. Well, thanks very much. And. 
interesting reflections about um, the nature of state legislative work and how the assumptions behind that, the original assumptions about you know, who would be doing that, um, don't really favor uh, the schedules that women typically have. So very, very interesting. Um, Makeda, uh, your thoughts on uh, have we made progress? Uh, you know, it's just an honor to sit here with this esteemed panel and to hear Secretary Albright's comments and Susan Weir's. Uh, I just sit here and I feel like the baby, obviously, to, to have, you know, be born in a generation that is just uh, reaping the benefits of all of the struggles. Um, I think we have made progress, right? I measure some of the progress, even as an immigrant to this country, by some of the political inroads and victories that Black women, who I deeply admire, uh, have made thus far, right? So Shirley Chisholm, Secretary Albright talked about uh, finding her voice, you know, when Shirley Chisholm found her voice in 1969, oh my gosh, how scary. She used it to uh, fight and, and advance legislation on behalf of women, uh, employment and education for minorities. Um, and, and so, you know, today we've got Carol Mosley Braun, Aisha Presley, Stacey Abrams, and of course, uh, my hero, uh, uh, Senator Kamala Harris, a new VP uh, nominee. I think it's important though to sort of step back and ask, uh, you know, what else is left to be done? And how can we help these women, uh, 122 of them who are black and multiracial that are running for office this um, November to find their voice so that we can hear, you know, their legislative priorities. Cause those priorities to me reflect uh, the concerns of uh, American families, 13.6 uh, million uh, single parent families who are mostly headed by women uh, caring for children. Uh, we need to find out how do we, um, you know, support their dignity, support their their fight for economic uh, uh, equality and, you know, earning quality wages on par with men, uh, regardless of their backgrounds or their family circumstances, for example. Uh, I think I'm, again, just blessed to sit here and be able to reflect on the record and measure that progress and be part of that generation that can, uh, you know, continue to benefit. But there's so much work to be done. And I'm excited that we have an opportunity here, uh, hopefully in this election season, to realize some of that, you know, those goals and those potentials. Great. Thanks, Makeda. Um, Elaine, I, I want to start the next round of questions with you. Um, it, you know, it's an election year, obviously. Uh, in 2016, we had the first woman to head a major party presidential ticket. Uh, in 2020, we had the first woman of color as part of a major uh, party ticket. Um, we've also had that huge class of 2018 coming in as both you uh, and Makeda have alluded to. Um, so what more is left for women to do in the political sphere? Have we arrived or is there more to do? Well, I, I'll tell you, we, I think this is going to be a real history making year. And let me tell you why. So in us political scientists have a term called realignment. And a realigning election is a big deal historically. Uh, 1932 was the big realigning election that brought Franklin Roosevelt into power. Really, it just up, a realigning election just turns everything upside down, changes everything. Um, we then had a big realignment that took place between 1976 and 2000. And, uh, and that was the movement of Southern states from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party. In 1976, Jimmy Carter won all the Southern states. Jimmy Carter, a Southerner. In 2000, Edward, a Southerner, lost all the Southern states, including his home state of Tennessee. So that was, that's the most recent realignment that we've experienced in American politics. Well, starting in 2017, we are seeing signs of maybe the first ever gender realignment. And I wanna credit my uh, colleague and my former um, uh, colleague, partner in crime and politics, um, Morley Winograd, who's been writing about this for our FixGov blog. And this gender realignment is fascinating. So of course we remember in 2017, the March on Washington and the, the huge women's march that happened right after the inauguration. We then saw, however, more significantly in the races that took place in 2017, the Alabama Senate race, which, which turned that seat to a democratic seat for the first time ever. And then the off-year elections, particularly the Virginia governor's race, we saw lopsided votes for women going to the Democratic Party. We had not seen this in 2016. 2016, uh, the women's votes for, Demo for Hillary were basically offset by the men's votes for Trump. We didn't have that big of a shift. 
We then go into 2018, where we had a 23 point gender gap. This is the biggest gender gap in 20 years. And of course we saw it in all the women elected, but it wasn't just women elected. Women were voting for Democrats. They were moving into the Democratic party. That's what a realignment is. 2019, we saw a lot of special elections. And again, we saw this lopsided behavior of women voting Democratic, not men. And then looking ahead, looking at some of the key Senate races this year, if you look at North Carolina, the Democratic, there's a gender gap, a, a fairly substantial gen, gender gap in the North Carolina race in favor of the Democrat. In Arizona, there's a substantial gender gap in favor of the Democrat, even though the Republican is a woman and the Democrat is a man. And of course, Trump's approval ratings are only 38% among women and they are 57% among men. So we are seeing a, we're seeing something is happening here. I don't know if it will be as big as it looks right now in 2020. I also don't know if like previous realignments, it will be a permanent realignment, but this is maybe the biggest movement we've seen demographically um, in many, many years, ever since African-Americans moved from being Republicans to being solidly democratic. We've got this, the same thing is going on with women now. And it's, it's, Quite amazing. Fascinating. That that's that is really fascinating. I'm sure we're going to bat that around a little bit more um, as we go through the discussion. So, Makeda, um, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, women of color and um, their uh, emergence as a, a really major political force. But I just want to ask you, as somebody who has is active in studying a variety of different realms, uh, economic, political, and social. Um, what more does this country need to do to ensure that women of color in particular are experiencing the dignity that comes with increased uh, equality uh, in, in the economic, political and social realms? I would say that I'd follow, I like Elaine's phrase there, this generational realignment. I, I would say that the, uh, the dignity of uh, uh, women, particularly women of color, is so intertwined with the you know, political and sort of social constructs that we need to make sure this is an, an intersectional uh, 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 um, alignment that intersects with the issues of gender and race and class. Um, I think, you know, central to that, Camille, will be this idea of, you know, congressional representation. That's going to be sort of central to, uh, you know, underscoring, shoring up the representation, the equality and the dignity of uh, women working color, uh, women of work of color in particular. I just want to say that, you know, it's when you think of dignity, it's work, it's ability to sort of care for your family. That's what gives you that drive. Um, you know, it gives you that sense of pride as a woman, as a parent, as anybody from any working uh, background. Uh, so I think we, it's important to sort of figure out how to get these women uh, elected um, and even the men as well, right? Whose agendas really represent and prioritize, I think the concerns of working class and low income families. Too many of them are working in precarious uh, low wage jobs, little, no access to quality childcare, uh, even during the pandemic to either search for work or to keep working. Uh, too many are uh, food and housing insecure and, and many others and millions others are struggling under the weight of uh, you know, student loan debt. And that's a lot to climb out for, from under, right? To sort of figure out you know, where your dignity sort of stands and sort of sets up in this uh, uh, discourse. Um, but it's important to have these agendas float to the top of these uh, uh, elections, local races, you know, certainly at the top of the ticket so that these uh, you know, agendas seep through they, uh, and then they prioritize the real issues that I think matter to you know, families that are in my community, for example, where I live in a you know, predominantly uh, you know, African-American low-income community and dignity matters, right? These policies uh, matter for shoring up their economic and their housing securities as well. So uh, alignment as, uh, and maybe potentially a new, new uh, political alignment as Elaine talked about and the importance of really focusing that alignment on policies that ensure dignity uh, and ensure the ability to take care of your family and to uh, you know, fulfill your aspirations. Um, so Bell, uh, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, that pandemic has, uh, you know, for better or for worse, um, raised some issues that, you know, women have been talking about for a long time, like uh, paid leave and childcare. 
And so we've made, you know, we've obviously made some progress economically, but those are still, you know, very much in play. Uh, what more do you think needs to be done to ensure that women can fully participate in the economy? Well, I very much agree with a lot of what's already been said. And I thought Tina Chen's PowerPoint was terrific as well. Uh, I think Elaine said it all when she talked a lot about motherhood as being a um, inhibitor of women in politics. And it is also the big inhibitor of their getting ahead in the workforce. Uh, they basically are trying to do two jobs, not just one. And so we need two kinds of adjustments. One, we need uh, men to be doing more, be sharing more in the care of children, doing housework and all the other things that women have traditionally done. In addition, we need, I think, new public policies that recognize the fact that most women are now in the workforce. And uh, if you are in a two earner couple or you are a single parent, and you're responsible for your family's uh, income, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of education and especially if you don't have a partner, uh, you're in deep trouble as Makeda suggested. Uh, I think that uh, of, of a single mom earning the minimum wage, which depending upon what state you live in, could give you an annual income of anywhere between uh, 15 and $25,000 a year. But imagine having several children, being the sole support of your family, uh, living in a, major, in, in a major city where rents are very high, and having to pay for childcare, which is roughly as expensive as going to college. So we do need more childcare, and we do more, need more paid family leave. Uh, I have been honored to be a co-director of a whole project on paid family leave that is a partnership between Brookings and AEI, and we put out two reports on that topic so far and have two new books coming out this fall on that topic. On childcare, I think one solution has to be to align uh, school hours a little better with working hours. And in addition, um, we need universal pre-K. And then finally, we should take the existing childcare tax credit that's used by middle, many middle-class families, but it's not available to low-income families, but could be made available to them if we made it refundable and made it a little more generous. So I could go on, but those would be some of my top line suggestions. Great, thank you, Belle. Um, Makeda, I'm gonna start with you for this part of the conversation. Um, you know, We obviously uh, at Brookings are very interested in policy, policy solutions like many of the ones that Bell just mentioned. Um, and I'm gonna ask you, you know, what, what uh, policy solutions should the US be pursuing to ensure that women can anticipate equality in the economy and in politics? Uh, I think I'd underscore everything that Bell said, but I wanna just add a little bit around this idea of, you know, childcare. Uh, yes, childcare is a, I think, um, an inhibitor, it, it certainly is, uh, it slows you down in terms of your progression and, and ability to engage fully in the labor force. Um, but I think, you know, we we need to sort of broaden our, our idea about what care looks like for a lot of women in this country. It's not just, you know, the care that they provide for children, but many minority and immigrant families, for example, live in multi-generational settings. And that means a lot of them are not only caring for children, they're caring for elderly parents, uh, disabled family members, um, and that burden, of course, you know, disproportionately falls to them. So, how do we figure out, you know, a way to provide universal family care that sort of moves us away from this maternal patriarchal vision as to who women are and what the roles are that they should play and have played traditionally? Um, and I, I really want to uh, highlight, you know, what's important around sort of domestic workers, right? A Ninety-two percent of domestic workers who are all in a sort of below the poverty line are women and women of color, particularly. Uh, so, it, you know, if we sort of think of ways to to leverage this intersectional realignment that Elaine sort of talked about, um, it's not just about my identity as a woman, it's my identity as a woman who cares for children. It's the identity of a woman who lives in a poor quality neighborhood and therefore uh, needs access to, um, you know, a promised neighborhood, for example. I think it's, it's, you know, critical, for example, to lift up again these women who are bringing their working class backgrounds. This, this is an extremely diverse cohort 
and they're infusing their experiences and the kinds of priorities and proposals that they're sort of putting forward. Let's talk about Sen Senator uh, Harris for a second. Her MORE Act, the Marijuana uh, Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, was one of the most comprehensive solutions when it came to uh, social justice reform um, in terms of cannabis and, and redressing the harms of the war on drugs. Um, because of her background, she understood that you've got to provide comprehensive roadmaps and leave no uncertainty about how you, uh, for example, uh, effectuate record, uh, criminal record expungement. Uh, criminal record expungement will go a long way to reduce the unemployment rate for formerly incarcerated Black women. Again, intersectionality. Uh, last estimated in 2017 to be nearly 46%. Nearly one in two uh, formerly incarcerated women cannot participate in the labor market because of a criminal record. Um, and on top of that, you know, you layer on the fact that they're returning to homes and continuing to share in the sort of child uh, family care burden. Uh, so I think it's really critical, again, to sort of figure out how do we realign these outdated modes as to who women are and who the how these women are going to be and who they are presently, um, different from who they were, uh, to think about you know, ways to advance, I think, much more bold and innovative uh, proposals that really get to the heart of their lived experiences. Great, thank you. Um, Belle, what other uh, policies do you wanna add to the conversation? I know you've been working a lot on this, and so um, I'm sure the two or three minutes you took before were probably um, you know, did not uh, address everything that you have proposed or are thinking about proposing? Well, one of the things that um, I have worried about is the uh, lost opportunity to do something about um, unplanned childbearing. Uh, you know, if you ask women, and especially poor and minority women, whether or not they uh, wanted or intended to have a child when they did, uh, an overwhelming number of them say, no, the timing was all wrong. And it's not that they don't want children, but the children are coming at awkward times and not always with the right person. So I'll give you my favorite statistic on this. 60% of all births in the United States to unmarried women under the age of 30 are unintended according to the mother herself and she tells that to the survey taker after the child was born and therefore after she's probably done a certain amount of bonding with the child. So it's not that she doesn't care about the child. It's not that she doesn't want to be a mother. It's that it really came at the wrong uh, time. And so in the Affordable Care Act in 2012, there was a provision that would have made uh, the most effective forms of birth control available to everyone in clinics, including clinics for people who can't afford to go to the you know, private doctor or whatever, and um, at no cost. Uh, the most effective forms of birth control, by the way, the upfront cost is about $1,000. And what 20-year-old can afford $1,000? And that 20-year-old may still be in college, may not be settled in a career, may not be with the uh, guy that she eventually wants to parent with. So uh, unfortunately, the current administration turned all of that around and we're stuck back in a situation where we don't have guaranteed access to affordable birth control for all women. And I wrote a whole book on that. So excuse me for going on about it, but I really do think it's part of women's empowerment. Great, thank you very much, Bill, for that contribution. Right there. May I jump in one second, Camille, and say oh, yeah. a second and third Bell's uh, statement around and you know recommendations for affordable birth control. I do think though that we have to again sort of think about that effect across uh, different populations. Deferring uh, child care for African child uh, birth for African American women to later in life increases both maternal and uh, you know neonatal uh, mater maternity mortality rates. Excuse me. So on the one front, yes, but on the other hand, we need to package those kinds of policies with um, you know solutions and funding to both study um, black maternal mortality rates and also to advance solutions to to, to to reduce those rates. And at the same time, to also think about ways to reduce or empower the you know, institutions and uh, uh, agencies to combat medical uh, discriminant discrimination, which disproportionately impacts uh, women of color. Great. Thank you, Makeda. Um, Elaine, uh, let's talk a little bit about politics. Um, 
So what changes need to, to be made to ensure that women continue to be full partners in politics? Well, you know, it, I think it's the same sort of thing that we're talking about, frankly, in economics in, and in the professions. There, there is the beginning of a conversation about how we restructure the movement up in various professions. Politics is a profession for most people. They start at a, at a local level. They run their first race. Uh, most men are running their first race in their 30s and then moving on up. And we see that in a variety of professions. Um, my daughter, some years ago, wrote a piece for the Boston Globe about um, the medical profession. And one of the things that happens to doctors is that because of the, of the, the route, route they're on, right, the most intense work period, their residency, coincide, tends to coincide with their childbearing age. It, it's it's terrible. I mean, you know, they have this they have this boot camp for doctors where you, you have to be on call, you have to be there 15 hours a day. Well, you know, that's not really good if you're pregnant. And so so would be women doctors face this face a a world that was made for men, and would be women politicians face a world that was made for men as well. And so I think as we rethink um, professional. Um, and this is different than I think what Makeda was talking about. As we think, as we rethink the professional um, lines, right? Whether it's getting tenure at a university, becoming a doctor, whatever it is, um, we need to think about how they can be made different to accommodate women who are who do need a little time. Yes, we should have childcare, et cetera, but come on, let's be real here. We're all mothers on this, on this call. I mean, you, you do you can have great childcare, but you still need a little bit of time to have that baby and nurse that baby and take care of that baby. And we want a little bit of time. So if the if your professional world is saying to you, no, you have to do it now and you have to do it this way. It just doesn't work for women. And, and I think that's why we see women drop out of professions, drop out of the workforce, women who have great standing in their community um, when approached to run for office say, oh no, I, I really can't do that. You know, and I, I think that this this is the same, we need the same rethinking here as we do in many other professions. Thank you very much. So uh, we are now gonna move to uh, questions from our audience. Um, the first one that I'm gonna take is from Dee Easy, and uh, she's asking us, how much progress have women made in physical sciences and engineering fields? And I know Makeda, this is something um, near and dear to your heart. So I'm gonna let you uh, answer that. Uh, so I don't have the numbers ready with me, but I can just say it's hard to sort of give these kind of global responses to these questions that pit minority groups against each other because context matters, right? As a Black woman economist myself, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, the economics community finally we begin to respond and thankfully to Janet Yellen and others respond to the stark racial disparities in economic profession that have caused uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, economists either face disrupted careers, you know, they were, there's so much hostility in the field that they ended up choosing something else um, or others, you know, finding that they have to alter themselves. Uh, I think uh, Secretary Albright sort of spoke about this, um, you know, alter who they are, alter their research and we get the, you know, the short end of that. Um, in the corporate context, I think the relative disparities are, you know, somewhat, you know, better. But I, I think what we need to sort of do is sort of figure out, right, more than a half a century later, after the Civil Rights Act, many minorities, including Blacks, you know, continue to face stark disparities in a variety of contexts. STEM, I think econ economics does worse than STEM degrees. <laughs> um, so what I think we need to do is right, really focus on keeping pace with strengthening and improving our democ democratic institution so that we can forcefully respond, right, to any threat uh, to the security of vulnerable groups. Uh, Black women in particular. Uh, right now under the Trump administration, we've seen our Department of Justice just become a private law firm uh, that somehow has abdicated its responsibility um, you know, to, for to enforce the Civil Rights Act, fair housing, uh, the Equal, equal uh, Credit Opportunity Act. Um, and so it, without our institutions, I think you know, we're gonna get caught up in this vortex where we're, uh, my, my 
comparing fates, mine is worse than yours. But we really need to sort of keep our eye on the prize. And thanks to the administration, uh, we understand the value of that prize. And hopefully come the 2020 election, we can sort of collectively appreciate that prize um, and you know, make, make a change. Great, thank you very much. So we have another question from Nancy Kirk. Um, and uh, Susan, uh, I know you're still with us and I think this would be a great question um, for you to kind of illuminate for us. So um, the question is, what in your opinion was the effect of women's, women's suffrage on women's colleges and that, you know, the whole concept there, right? Um, and uh, what do you think is the effect um, of, of the kind of the evolution um, of how women have uh, progressed politically um, on women's colleges today? Um. You're hearing me. I think you're not seeing me because I don't seem to be able to, to join. Um, oh, now here I am. Here I am. Start Great, going. perfect. Yes, we see you and hear you. <laughs> and now I've forgotten the question. Um, it's about this is, this is about the effect of women's suffrage on the, the whole concept of women's colleges. Yeah. Well, I can, in some ways, as a historian, I, of course, take it further back. And I think of you know, one of those major changes that precedes the passage of the 19th Amendment is the expansion of higher education for women. It's absolutely central to the changes and the new women that then become suffragists. So it's very much embedded in that, in that question. Having said that, the colleges before and after have not always been hotbeds of activism uh, on feminism or anything else. Uh, clearly women's colleges do provide leadership opportunities. I too am a product of wealthy college um, for women, uh, but have not until recently really stepped up um, to, to play a leading role. Uh, my sense is we need all the help we can get. We're all in this together and women's colleges have a strong and important tradition of empowering women and let's harness that energy. Great, thank you very much, Susan. Um, we, have, we have another question from Cheryl Estrada and um, uh, you know, Bill, Bell, you might be in the best position to answer this, but I'm sure my colleagues will, my other colleagues will wanna weigh in as well, um, including Susan. Um, why does uh, pay equity for women continue to be a hurdle in corporate America? Well, when I was writing my doctoral dissertation, um, women only made uh, less than 60% as much as men. Now, if we're talking about women and men who both work full time, um, the ratio is at about 83%, women earning about 83% of men. And a lot of any remaining gap has to do with the prior questions, which is what fields do women study and what occupations do they go into? It's further complicated by the fact that there is some evidence and many of us believe that because women have not had and that the kind of work they do has not had the same respect that that done by men, uh, jobs that have traditionally been female jobs, even if they require as much or more education than a male job, actually pay less. So um, that goes to a sort of broader sense of women's work being um, discounted or uh, diminished. In order to make further progress, I think we need to do all of the things we've already talked about, childcare, paid leave, higher minimum wages, and so forth. And um, so I, I will save my words for others to add to that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, other thoughts, or I can move on to another question. So we, go ahead. No, launch another question, why don't you? Okay, great, excellent. Um, we have a, a, a question from Carrie uh, Ederhus, who's asking, uh, and Elaine, you might be the best position to answer this. Do you predict that Congress will lift the lapsed deadline for the ratification of the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment? 
You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, it depends on what happens in the Senate, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if in fact there's a substantial Democratic victory and Democrats do get a large number of um, senators, then that might happen, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that might be brought back. Um, but there's a lot of things, um, I mean, I, th I think of this in the same way I think about DC statehood, okay? Um, there, there's just a lot of things which uh, a, a full democratic Congress could conceivably do, but we don't really know yet if we're gonna have a democratic Senate. And of course, given the, given the rules of the Senate, unless they change, um, you need a big majority in the Democrats in a Democratic Senate. So I think that that might be on the agenda, but it really does depend on those Senate races this year. Great, excellent. So we have time for one more round um, of uh, discussion and I'm gonna provide my own question, which is, um, you know, we have, obviously we have the election coming up in November. Uh, we will either have a new set of people in the White House or we'll have a continuation of the uh, Trump administration that we have currently. So for the 2021 White House, regardless of who's there, what should be the most important policy agenda that they should be pursuing that will, that will help elevate uh, women and uh, continue to help them um, uh, obtain equality, both in terms of their their uh, participation in the marketplace and their participation in politics. And I'm going to start with you, Bill. I think the question is kind of easy to tell you the truth. If you're talking about January 2021, I think the priority has to be to end the pandemic. Now that's going to help everyone, but it's going to be especially helpful to women because women are the ones who are stuck at home trying to do a job from home and trying to take care of kids whose daycare or schools are closed. And as I said earlier, they're also disproportionately involved in doing a lot of the essential work that we all uh, need to uh, live. Uh, so it is true that the uh, mortality rates are highest uh, amongst men rather than women, and of course, especially high amongst minority groups. But uh, I think we uh, have to all come together as a society. And uh, to some extent, I don't like the fact that we have to constantly talk about every different segment. I mean, I understand the reasons for it. I understand the need for racial and gender and class justice uh, and more equality and less poverty and so forth, a fairer society. We need a fairer society. And I, I love what Makeda's kept talking about dignity. Everybody needs dignity, but I think we also need to come together as a society to defeat this virus and this pandemic, and we need leadership from the White House to do that. Thank you, Bell. Elaine? Um, I, I'll, I think Bell hit the nail on the head. I would, I would just emphasize one thing. Women have enough trouble having um, full-time jobs, supporting their families, having moving through the career uh, paths for, for women with, it, with education. They have enough trouble as it is. We have just added, because of the pandemic, a new role. And that role is educator. So there's an awful lot of women out there who are going to be faced with having to monitor and augment schoolwork. And we already have seen some anecdotal evidence and a little bit of statistics about women dropping out of the workforce because of the coronavirus. So we have got to get this thing under control um, and we've got to make sure, this is another thing, we've got to make sure that when we do start getting vaccine therapeutics, that these are fairly distributed throughout the society, that they don't go to rich people first with, with health insurance, that there is really equal access to um, because you can, boy, you can see that one coming down the pike, right? You can, you can see a situation where um, basically wealthy men are going to get the, the vaccines first and, and women won't. So I think you got to really uh, pay attention to that. Great. Thank you, Elaine. Makeda, we, uh, you're going to have the last word on this question. Oh, good. I would say uh, the pandemic is immediate. It's urgent. It's palpable. We feel it. What's really critical to our social cohesion um, 
is monitoring equity, accountability for equity across every single segment of our country. We need leadership from the incoming administration, from the White House. I would love to see um, uh, an Office of Equity established at the White House that drives and sets the North Star for what we intend to accomplish as a society moving forward, where no one, regardless of intersectional uh, inequities or, or backgrounds, should ever be limited. And when we and, and to, to to keep uh, that our, our um, you know foot on the gas, we have to you know be able to measure it see its impact, see its evolution, and hold each other accountable, starting from the federal agencies all the way down. I certainly think that equity um, and tangible concrete policies that drive it forward and hold us accountable should be uh, the centerpiece of this incoming Congress and uh, the administration. Well, thank you. With that uh, inspirational uh, ending, I want to thank my fellow panelists here. I also just want to say thank you for to everybody for what a fantastic uh, speaker lineup. And um, thank you all for your questions. And we certainly look forward to welcoming you here again at Brookings Events. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.